Recently, I've been getting into shooting motion picture film, specifically 16 millimeter film, which is arguably the most unique and incredible image you can get out of a camera. Incredible tones and colors, insane dynamic range, finer grain than its little brother Super 8, 16 millimeter film will leave you drooling and lusting over how freaking dang good it looks. And if you needed further proof, just look to all the filmmakers and products out there to emulate 16 millimeter film. There's a lot of them. Though it can be quite intimidating, it can be quite simple to shoot. So whether you are a pro or a beginner, there is a 16 millimeter camera for you. 16 millimeter film truly feels like a cheat code to get beautiful cinematic footage. So in this video, I'm gonna break down the things I've learned in the process of shooting this format, give you some tips and tricks, and hopefully make the process of you getting into shooting film easier. Okay, I'm gonna frame up this first shot. I have light post. Cool street sign, some old cars, classic, some cool ivy. Um, here, I need a meter actually. You just set your ISO, set your shutter speed, which is always locked in on your film, which is nice. So my shutter speed is 1 60th if I'm shooting 24, which if you're a filmmaker, you're like, that's not right, but I don't know, just how Kodak did it. Um, so cool, I'm gonna shoot an F11. Uh, my shutter speed is locked at 1 60th and then I should be pretty happy. Again, I have 500 speed film, so I'm locked in at that ISO. First shot. All right. Okay, so let's chat film stocks and shutter speed. There are three main film stocks you will see most commonly use, all three from Kodak. The first is Vision 3 50D, which is a 50 ISO film daylight color balanced. You will see a Vision 3 250D, which is the same thing, just with a little bit higher ISO. And you'll also see Vision 3 500T, which is a 500 speed film tungsten balance, which means it's gonna be a little cooler than what you get from the other two films. 250D is going to be your most versatile film and because it's daylight balanced, it's a little warmer. 50D is the only film that I've kind of had bad experiences with, which we can get into later. Okay, so I think I have my second shot here that I want, kind of this just like more punched in tight um, on this industrial stuff. Um, right now is not ideal weather. I mean, typically you'd want to shoot in sun, right? You'd want to shoot where the sun is illuminating colors and there's nice blue sky. But for right now, it's actually a good thing that we have a higher speed film because we have more ISO to work with, which is nice. And a part of the, a part of the dock I'm filming is a little moodier. So maybe this is actually, maybe, maybe this will match. Okay, ready? Three, two. One amazing thing about shooting 16 millimeter film is that your shutter speed is dependent on your frame rate. A lot of times when you're shooting digital, you have your exposure triangle, ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. But when you're shooting 16 millimeter film, all you really need to worry about is your aperture. The reason is because depending on what film you're shooting, that is going to dictate your ISO. Like I said, 250D, 50D, 500T, those films, that number is the film speed, which is the ISO. Most cameras have a variable frame rate, so they can shoot anywhere from eight, usually to around 50 frames per second, so you do get some slow-mo, and your shutter speed is just automatically dictated off of what frame rate you shoot. So again, if you're used to shooting digital, you're used to worrying about your shutter speed, and with 16 millimeter film, you don't even have to touch it. It is automatically dictated based off of what frame rate you choose. Based on what frame rate you choose, you will hear the motor go faster as well. Eight frames per second will sound a little slower when 50 frames per second will sound pretty fast. The reason being is because it's literally moving more film, more frames through the camera per second. And just to reiterate, I mean, I'm still so new to this. This has been me deep diving YouTube, testing some roles, getting my hands on a camera. Um, so there's still a ton to learn, but yeah, hopefully, I don't know, I just kind of want to take you guys along with me on this journey of shooting 16 mil and what that looks like. I mean, these old cars are so cool. We should probably just snag something through this fence. I just love, it just looks so, 
industrial and cool. 16 millimeter Vision 3 film has an insane amount of latitude and I highly recommend overexposing. The colors are richer and it's much easier to retain the highlight detail if you overexpose than it is to retain the shadow detail if you underexpose. I use a pretty janky app called Light Meter on my iPhone and it basically gives me an approximation of what aperture I should be shooting. I set my shutter speed, which is dictated by my frame rate. And then I set my ISO, which is based on the film speed I'm shooting. And then that gives me my aperture. I'm typically shooting around an F8 or higher to make focusing a lot easier because the cameras are old, the viewfinders are fuzzy, and it can be hard to focus with, but we'll get to focusing later on. Okay, so like I mentioned before, I had some bad experiences with 50, and that is just because there is less latitude with that film, and you also need a ton of light. 50 speed film, 50 ISO is pretty low. <laughs> I actually have learned this the hard way and underexposed some city footage in Nashville, which I'll lay over here. Um, you can just tell it, like it doesn't look as rich. Um, there's no data in the shadows and there's just no way to save it. Um, so typically over, overexposure is the way to go. All right, I'm gonna get focused and do a little rack with these bushes. Okay, ready, set. So when in doubt, meter for the shadows and use that as your reading. What I often do is I meter for the shadows, meter for the highlights, and then kind of split the difference between them. All right, we got a little bit of rain. So I'm in an F8. Zone is, we can do, yeah, like five feet to 60 feet is our zone. Yeah, and then stay toward the edge and then stay toward the curb, that curb. So there are a variety of cameras and the two you'll hear the most about, in my opinion, are the K3 and the Rex 5. I've shot with both and the K3 is your simplest 16 millimeter camera and the one I personally own because it is the one that is the most affordable. Both the K3 and Rex 5 are spring wound, which means that they don't take batteries and you can crank the side to wind the motor. The K3 typically comes with a 17 to 69 millimeter 1.9 lens and the Rex 5 has a bayonet system in which you can mount up to three lenses and rotate accordingly. Both these cameras take 100 foot spools of film and are great for beginners and pros alike. The only downside is because there's no battery, you are limited in how long you can roll. For battery powered 16 millimeter cameras, you can roll all three minutes through a roll of film with one go. With this, you are limited to how much you wind up that motor, which is typically around 30 seconds. There are three main aspect ratios that these cameras come in, regular 16, super 16, and ultra 16. Most cameras come stock at regular 16 and require modifications to get the super and ultra look. Super and ultra are the most sought after due to the aspect ratio. All it's doing is exposing more of the film on the film strip and reaching all the way to the edges, which brings your frame size to around a 16 by nine. So I think something that's different when we're doing video versus doing photos is like, I would probably be taking a ton of photos of something like this because it's interesting, it's kind of abandoned, has some cool colors to it. But with video, it's like you just need, you need like a subject, you need action, you need a little more story. Like you have, in a photo you have like one frame to kind of capture your story. In video, you have 24 frames per second to tell that story. So it is, it can be a little more challenging sometimes with video because it's like, this, this looks cool, but like nothing's happening in the scene. There needs to be purpose for the shot of how it's gonna fit into an edit, I mean, I just think that's kind of important to note because it looks cool, but we haven't really. I know, like that 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 white smoke on the dark smoke. I could actually try to get some cool angles here. I keep saying that I'm I'm not going to shoot it, and then I keep. Now onto something you're going to either love or hate, and that is light leaks. This happens when light is literally leaking through a part of the camera or you open up the back of the camera and expose the film to light accidentally. The Bolex I was borrowing actually had a broken film counter. So in order to see if I had any film left, I actually had to open the back and peek in. This obviously caused light leaks and you can ruin your favorite shots by doing this. So I recommend doing that as little as possible. And hopefully the camera you're using has a film counter that works. When loading and unloading film, you can do so in daylight, but I recommend still finding a darker space, something that's not in direct sun, in order to load and unload your film. If you wanna get really serious about the light leaks as well, you can gaff tape any cracks or seams on your camera in order to ensure that no light is getting in. Oh, I'm in front of the camera now. I'm gonna film a quick clip. All right, I'm gonna zone focus, so you look at you, you, from three feet, 
uh, I'll go, you know, I'll go from two feet to 15 feet. You'll be in focus. Are you just gonna do the whole thing straight through? Yeah. Cool. All right, here we go. Ready? <laughs> okay, I rolled that whole time. Now, the scary part is if the film ran out in the middle of it, then we're gonna have nothing. So this is the moment of truth. Wait, you run out, you have no, oh, no wait, what? <laughs> The whole clip's gone? The whole clip is gone? Not the whole clip, it'll just cut off. Like the minute the yeah, film's yeah, yeah. over, then there, yeah. you, you have no shot. There's no warning. There's still film! Dang. Dude, we have so much film. I didn't land the, the, I'm frothing. I didn't land the board slide though. Okay, let's go to a, a, a different spot and shoot some more skating. Wait, what if I get, what if you get a quick clip? Perfect, try perfect, and then you get love cut it. To that? Okay, so now this is getting a little technical and honestly is a topic that could use a video in and of itself to explain and that is zone focusing. On pro sets, you'll see a lot of filmmakers actually put their camera on sticks and then measure the distance to their subject. The reason is because then they can look at their lens and set their focus versus looking through a fuzzy viewfinder and kind of guessing. So when it comes to zone focusing on the Rex 5, the lenses had dots that were orange to show my zone. They would change and grow wider as I made my aperture higher. Higher aperture equals bigger zone. The other thing to note here is the distance to your subject. If your subject is closer to you, it is going to be harder to get them in focus. If your subject is far away, then it's going to be easier. The reason is because as they're closer, your zone becomes smaller. As they're farther, your zone becomes bigger. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it does get pretty technical, but obviously focusing and getting focus on your 16 mil camera is really important. So what I usually do is I'll look through my viewfinder and get an approximate focus. Then I'll peek my head above my camera and kind of guess that distance to my subject, maybe it's 15 feet, maybe it's 20 feet, and then I'll look at my lens and see where my approximation was. If it's somewhat in the same ballpark, then I'll shoot. If not, then I'll readjust. So again, what I'm doing is I'm looking through my viewfinder to get focus. On my K3, I'll zoom all the way in and get that focus and then reframe. And then I'll look at the distance to my subject and the distance that's on my lens. And if it's somewhat accurate, then I shoot. Fortunately, there's a little room for error with 16 millimeter film because it's all kind of soft and fuzzy, but generally you want your subject to be in focus and missing focus just generally isn't fun. It sucks. All right, I'm good. All right, what is up y'all? So right now I have the Bolex like I had before. I have a little bit more of 500T from Kodak, which again is 500 speed film tungsten balanced. We have a pretty cool scene here. It is pretty low light. Basically I strung um, pretty much in the scrappiest way possible, strung a blue light to the ceiling and then have a bunch of practicals in here. We don't have a ton of high powered lights, so we are running a little bit low light, but right now I'm gonna meter um, and see what the max aperture I can shoot in here um, with 500 speed film. Okay, because the shutter speed of the film, if I'm shooting 24 frames, is locked in at 1 60th, and my ISO is gonna be at 500, um, I'll have to shoot at like an F2, F2.8, um, so we'll see how that gets. So we'll see how that turns out. I'm gonna have the guys come set up and then I'll play the footage right now. Hopefully it looks good at a shallow depth of field. All right, everyone. So I hope that that was helpful. Uh, 16 millimeter film has definitely reinvigorated me for filmmaking. Uh, I use it for select projects, but when I do get to use it, it is just an absolute ton of fun. There's a few channels on YouTube that if you want to learn more about 16 millimeter film that you should definitely check out. I'm probably butchering these names, but we have Bray Huntsicker, I believe, Lewis Potts, Kyle McDougal, and Analog Resurgence. I'll, I'll link them all down below. They all have their own value propositions, I would say, in terms of what you can learn from them about 16 millimeter film, but I've learned a ton from those four people and I think that you will too if you're more curious about shooting film. So like I said, I'm gonna continue shooting 16 millimeter film and hopefully can do more videos to bring you guys along with me on this process. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of room for error because there's, again, just like film photography, there's no way to know if you messed anything up until you pay for the scans, paid for it to get developed, and then you get all the film back. But again, I think it's totally worth it. When you do get that film back, it feels like Christmas morning. It feels like you just found this box of trinkets from your childhood in your attic and you like can't wait to play with them or something. It really is incredible. So thank you again for watching and I will see you guys in the next video. Cheers, y'all.